channel, Story on Friday, is made with some wonderful stories of Bengali literature. Today is the first story of, Satyajit Roy's, A Diary of a Space Traveler, from Shanku Campaign. Professor Trilokeshwar Shanku is a character from Bengali science fiction, introduced in Scottish Church College in 1969. The first appearance was in, Sandesh magazine with the short story, A Diary of a Space Traveler, authored by Satyajit Roy. From the very beginning, the Shanku stories captivated the minds of young readers. In the first story, Professor Shanku himself narrated the tale in the form of a diary. Subsequently, a total of 28 complete, and two incomplete diaries of Shanku were published until 1990. Over these 30 years, Shanku and his stories have remained a prime attraction for children. That was the beginning of Professor Shanku. One after another campaign begins. I took this story from the book Shanku's collection. Professor Shanku and Vidhusakar in the lead roles. Starting, A Diary of a Space Traveler. It was from Tarek Chatterjee, that I got Professor Trilokeshwar Shanku's diary. One afternoon, as I was sitting in my office, correcting the proof of an article scheduled for a puja magazine. Tarek Babu turned up, and dropped a red notebook on my desk. He said. Read it. It is a gold mine. He had brought short stories for me earlier. They were not all that good, but Tarak Babu was once known to my father, and judging by the state of his clothes, he was not exactly well off. So, I always gave him a little money when he brought me a story to read. This time, when he produced a diary instead of a story, I was naturally surprised. Professor Shanku disappeared about 15 years ago. Some believed that something had gone terribly wrong while he was doing an experiment, and that had killed him. But others wanted to say that he was still alive. He was just hiding in some remote corner of the country, to continue his work in secret. He would come out when the time was right. I had no idea if any of these speculations was correct, but I did know that Professor Shanku was a scientist. That he should have kept a diary seemed natural enough. But the question was, how did Tarak Chatterjee get hold of it? When I asked him, Tarak Babu smiled. Then he reached out, helped himself to a clove and cardamom from my little box of spices, and said. Do you remember, that case in the Sundarbans? Oh God, was he going to tell me another story about a tiger? Tarek Babu had this most annoying habit of dragging a tiger into whatever anecdote he happened to relate. Irritated. I asked. Which case do you mean? That meteorite. Surely, there is only one case. Yes, that was true. I remembered reading about it. About a year ago, a meteorite had fallen in the Matharia district in the Sundarbans. It was pretty large, possibly twice the size of the one kept in the museum in Calcutta. When I saw its picture in a newspaper, it had looked vaguely like a dark human skull. I asked, what has that meteorite got to do with this notebook? I am coming to that, do not get impatient. I went there in the hope of getting a few tiger skins. They are in great demand, and it's often possible to get a good price. You knew that, did not you? So, I thought, surely I had find three or four tigers, among all those animals that were killed. But no. Perhaps I got there too late. There was not a single tiger, or any other animal. Not even a dead deer. Oh. So, what did you do? All I could find were some snake skins. 
And that notebook. Somewhat taken aback, I said, that notebook. You mean it was just lying there? Yes, bang in the middle of the crater. When that meteorite fell, it created a massive crater. You have seen Lake in Calcutta, haven't you? Well, that crater was more than four times its size, I can tell you. That notebook was lying at its center. What are you saying? Hmm. I could see something red poking out of the ground. So, I went and pulled it out. Then I saw Professor Shanku's name on it, and promptly put it in my pocket. A notebook. No, a diary. Found in the crater left by a meteorite. Could it mean? Read it, just read it. You'll learn everything. You write fiction, don't you? You make things up. So, do I. This is far more gripping. I would not have parted with it, but right now my pocket's totally empty. So. As it happened, I did not have a lot of cash with me at that moment. Besides, I could not quite believe his story, so I gave him 20 rupees. But Tarak Babu seemed happy enough with that. He offered me his blessings and left. Durga Puja started not long after that day. I became so busy, that I totally forgot about the diary. I came upon it only recently, when I pulled a fat dictionary out of a bookshelf, and the diary slipped out from behind it. I picked it up and opened it. At once, something struck me as odd. As far as I could remember, the color of the ink had been green the first time when I had looked at it. Now it was red. How could that be? I put the diary in my pocket. Obviously, I had made a mistake. Maybe I had seen something else written in green ink, and confused it with the writing in the diary. Anyone could make a mistake like that. My heart skipped a beat, when I opened the diary at home. The ink was now blue. Then, an extraordinary thing happened. Before my very eyes, the ink turned from blue to yellow. There could be no mistake this time. The color of the ink was definitely changing. The diary fell from my trembling hands. My dog, Bullo, pounced upon it as soon as it hit the floor. No Bullo, no, no. It was Bullo's major occupation in life to try his teeth on any object he could find. He did not spare the diary either. But, amazingly, the teeth that had completely destroyed my new leather chap pals only two days before, could do no damage to the notebook. Every page remained intact. I tried pulling a page out, and realized that the paper was impossible to tear. It was like elastic, stretching if I pulled it, then shrinking back to its original size when I released it. An odd impulse made me, light a match and hold it against a page. It did not burn. Then I lit my stove, and dropped the diary into the naked flames. I let it remain there for as long as five hours. Nothing happened. Only the color of the ink continued to change. That same night, I stayed up to finish reading the diary. Now, I am simply going to repeat to you, what I read. It is for you, to judge whether it is true, or false. Possible, or absolutely impossible. Today is January 1st. A rather unpleasant incident happened, quite early in the morning. When I returned from my usual morning walk by the river, I was considerably startled to find, a weird-looking man in my bedroom. I screamed involuntarily, but realized at once that it was no intruder. I had simply caught my own reflection in a mirror. 
In the last few years my appearance has changed a lot. Normally, I have no use for a mirror, so I had hung a large calendar over it. Since, that calendar was now old, Prahlad must have decided, without consulting me, to remove it this morning. I am tired of Prahlad's actions. He's been with me for 27 years, yet it seems his brain does not function at all. Strange. My scream had brought him running to my room. I decided he needed a little punishment. So, I took out my snuff gun and tried it on him. The snuff in it is so potent that one shot, delivered somewhere in the region of a man's mustache, is quite enough. It is now 11 o'clock at night. Prahlad is still sneezing. If my calculations are correct, he will continue to sneeze for the next 33 hours. January 2nd. My anxieties regarding the rocket are slowly ebbing away. The closer I am getting to my date of departure, the more enthusiastic am I feeling. I get more sure of myself with every passing day. Now I am beginning to think that my first attempt failed, only because of Prahlad. How was I to know, that he had moved the arms of the clock when he was trying to wind it? In a complex venture like this, every second matters. Prahlad's mistake delayed me by nearly three and a half hours. No wonder that the rocket rose, and fell again with a loud thud. My neighbor, Avinash Babu, is claiming 500 rupees as compensation. He says my rocket fell in his kitchen garden, and destroyed the patch where he was growing radishes. That fellow is a bandit. His garden is all he can think about, he has no sympathy or concern for this huge project that was almost doomed. I must try to think of a suitable weapon, that can deal with people like him. January 5th. Prahlad is a fool, but it may well be useful to have him with me. I do not believe at all that, it is only brainy and intelligent people who can go on an expedition like mine. Sometimes slow and foolish people can show more courage than clever ones, as it takes them longer to work out the need, or reason, to feel scared. There is no doubt that Prahlad is very brave. I remember one particular occasion very well. A gecko had fallen from the ceiling on my bottle of bicornic acid, and overturned it. I was there, but could do nothing except watch helplessly, as the acid slowly began to spread towards a little heap of paradoxite powder. All my limbs went numb at the mirror. Thought of what might happen if the acid made contact with the powder. Prahlad entered the room at this crucial moment, saw me staring at the acid, grinned and coolly wiped it off with a towel. Had he not done so, in just five seconds, my entire laboratory, that gecko, Prahlad, myself, and even Bidhashikar would have been wiped clean. So I think, I will take Prahlad with me. Weight should not be a problem. Prahlad weighs 62 kilograms. My weight is 58 kilograms. My robot Bidhashikar is 90 kilograms, and all the other material weighs another 60 kilograms. My rocket can take anything up to 500 kilograms. January 6th. A few insects had got into the sleeves of my spacesuit. I was in the process of shaking them out, when Avinash Babu turned up. He said. I hear you are off to Chanpur, or is it Mongolpur? But what about the money you owe me? This was his idea of a joke. Any mention of science makes him burst into wisecracks. When I was building my rocket, he had said to me one day, Why don't you set it off on the day of Diwali? The local boys will find it quite entertaining. 
Sometimes I wonder if Avinash Babu is prepared to believe that Earth is round, and that it rotates around the sun. Perhaps he would ridicule even that idea. Anyway, today I ignored his jibes and tried to be warm and hospitable. I asked him to sit down, then told Prahlad to bring him a cup of tea. I knew that Avinash Babu did not take sugar in his tea, but a tiny pill of saccharin. I dropped a similar pill in his cup. That was my latest weapon. The idea came to me one day, when I happened to read about the Giambanastra in the Mahabharata. That weapon made its victim break into frequent yawns. Mine goes a step further. Not only does one yawn heavily, but eventually sinks into a deep slumber and is plagued by horrible nightmares. Last night, I had diluted only a quarter of a pill in a glass of fruit juice, and drunk it myself. This morning, I saw that the nightmares had been so terrifying that the left side of my beard had gone completely gray. January 8th. I have decided to take Newton with me. He has been walking in and out of my laboratory constantly over the last few days, and mayoing pathetically. Perhaps he knows that the time of my departure is now quite close. Yesterday, I offered him a fish pill. He ate it happily enough. Today, I placed the head of a fish beside a pill. He chose the pill. So, I need not worry about his food. All I have to do is make him a suit and a helmet as soon as possible. January 10th. Bidhushikar has been making a strange noise every now and then, over the last couple of days. It sounds like a groan. I find it most surprising. Bidhushikar is a robot, he isn't supposed to make unexpected noises. The only sound one expects from him is that of clanging, as he moves about and simply does what he is told to do. I made him, so I know his limitations. He does not have the power to think independently. However, there have been times when he has shown me otherwise. I can remember one occasion very well. The idea of building a rocket had only just occurred to me. I knew that no ordinary metal or component could help build a rocket, it would have to be something special. So I began experimenting with various objects, and finally made a compound, using toadstools, snakeskins, and empty shells of tortoise eggs. It was clear to me that, what I now needed to add to it was either tantrum borapaxinate or aqueous velisilica, in order to get the perfect material. Let's try the tantrum. I thought and was about to pour some out on a spoon, when a loud clanging noise began. Startled, I turned around and found that Bidhushikar was shaking his head, made chiefly of iron, violently from side to side. That was the source of the noise. What was the matter with him? I decided to take a look at him, and put the tantrum down. At once, he stopped shaking his head. I went over to him and inspected his insides. All appeared to be well. So I returned to my desk and picked up the tantrum again. Bidhushikar began clanging immediately. How perfectly strange. Was he really trying to stop me from using the tantrum? I left it and picked up the velisilica instead. Bidhushikar clanged once more. But this time, his head went up and down, as if he was nodding in full agreement. Eventually, I made the compound with velisilica and found complete success. Much later, pure curiosity made me experiment with the tantrum. It would have been far better if I had not. I will never forget that blinding green light, and the ear-splitting noise of the explosion that followed. January 11th. I dismantled Bidhushikar today, and examined all the machinery fitted inside him. 
Still, I could not find any reason why, he should be groaning from time to time. But then, such a thing is not altogether new. I have noticed before that, when I make an object using all my scientific skill, often it starts doing things I had not bargained for. Sometimes it seems as if some unseen force is working with me, totally without my knowledge. But could that really be true? Perhaps I am unaware of the full extent of my own powers. I have heard that some really gifted and creative scientists, have the same problem. They cannot gauge, how far their own creations will go. Another thought keeps coming back to me. It is more of a feeling, really. I feel an extraordinary attraction towards outer space. It is a feeling very difficult to describe in words. If you can imagine, a force that is the opposite of the force of gravity, then you might get an idea of what I mean. I feel convinced that if I can somehow rise above Earth, to a height from which gravity cannot pull me back, then this strange attraction will automatically guide me to a different planet. It is not, as if I have always felt such an attraction. It began after a particular incident, one that I cannot forget. It happened 12 years ago, in the month of October. I was reclining in an easy chair in my garden after dinner, enjoying the cool October breeze. In the months of October and November, I spend three hours every night on my easy chair in the garden, for it is at this time of the year that a large number of shooting stars can be seen. Every hour, I can see nine or ten such stars. I really enjoy watching them. That night, I had no idea how long I had been sitting outside, when suddenly I realized that one particular star appeared to be different from the others. It was getting larger, and it seemed to be coming down towards me. I stared at it fixedly. The star came right down to the level of the trees in my garden. Then it moved to the west and hung in midair like a huge firefly next to a flowering Golancha tree. It was an extraordinary sight. I tried rising to my feet in order to take a closer look, and woke up. I would have dismissed the whole experience as a dream. But I cannot do so for two reasons. The first is, the attraction for outer space that I began to feel from the next day. It prompted me to think of building a rocket. The other is that Golansha tree. The normal flowers on that tree disappeared the next morning. They were replaced by a new, peculiar flower. I do not know if anyone has ever seen such flowers anywhere else on earth. The petals of each flower are spread out like the fingers of a human hand. They look black in daylight and hang limply down. But, at night, they glow as if they are made of phosphorus. And, if there is a breeze, they rise and sway. At that time, each hand seemed to beckon me. January 21st. We left Earth seven days ago. This time, nothing went wrong with our timing, and we could leave on the dot of five. The total weight of passengers, and luggage that my rocket is carrying is 365 kilograms. Our food supply should last us five years. Newton does not have to be fed more than once a week. One fish pill is good enough for him, to last seven days. For Prahlad and myself, I have taken the special pill I made from the juice of the fruit on our banyan tree. I call it Bodhika Indica. One tiny pill, the size of a homeopathic globule keeps hunger and thirst at bay for 24 hours. I have taken 200,000 pills with me. Newton was restless during the first few days. Possibly because he wasn't used to being kept in a confined space. Since yesterday, however, he has been sitting quietly on my desk, staring out of the window. The sky looks totally black, but there are endless bright, luminous stars and planets. 
Newton looks at these and swishes his tail at times. Perhaps those planets strike him as the eyes of countless other cats. Bidhashikar has nothing to do, he just sits quietly in a corner. It is impossible to tell from his round, expressionless eyes whether he has a mind, or can feel any emotion. Prahlad appears to feel absolutely no interest in watching the scenery outside. He just sits and reads the Ramayana. Thank goodness, I taught him to read. January 25th. I am teaching Bidhashikar to speak. It is going to be a long haul, I can tell, but he seems to be making a real effort. Prahlad laughs at the way he pronounces each word, which annoys Bidhashikar no end. I have seen him stamp his metallic feet in protest and make that same groaning noise. Doesn't Prahlad realize how badly he may be hurt, if Bidhashikar struck him just once with his arms which are made of solid iron? Today, in order to check his progress, I asked Bidhashikar. How are you feeling? He did not reply at once. For a few seconds, he just rocked himself to and from. Then he joined his hands and clapped, making quite a lot of clanging noises. Finally, he rose to his feet, stood straight, inclined his head slightly, and said, I have no doubt that what he was trying to say was, good. Good. Today, the planet Mars is looking as big as a grapefruit. According to my calculations, we will get there in another month. The last few months passed without any problem. Prahlad finished the Ramayana, and is now reading the Mahabharata. This morning, I was peering through my binoculars at the planet we are heading for, when suddenly I became aware of Bidhashikar muttering something in a low voice. At first, I ignored him, but he kept making the same noise over and over. Clearly, he was trying to get some words out, quite a number of words, in fact. I wrote them down quickly, as far as I could make them out. They made no sense at all. Then, as I was still trying to read what I had written, Bidhashikar repeated the same words, in the same tone. It dawned upon me then that he was actually trying to sing. Or, at least, he was trying to utter the words of a song I had been humming a few days ago. I was amazed. Bidhashikar's pronunciation of the words left much to be desired, it is true, but his memory was truly remarkable. We can see nothing but Mars, when we look out of the window. The hazy lines on it are getting clearer. We should land there in about 24 hours. Now, when I think of Avinash Babu's jibes, I feel like laughing. I have put to one side all that we shall have to take with us. My camera, binoculars, weapons, first aid box each of these things will have to be carried. There is no doubt in my mind that there is life on Mars, though I have no idea whether that life is large or small peaceful or violent. Surely whatever creatures there are won't look anything like man. If their appearance is weird, that may well scare us at first. But what must be remembered is that, just as we have never seen any of them before, they haven't seen any of us. Prahlad isn't worried at all. He does not anticipate any trouble. I don't want to. An extraordinary thing happened while I was writing my diary a while ago. Bidhashikar had been rather quiet for the last few days. I couldn't see why. He hasn't yet learnt to speak properly. He cannot answer questions. All he can do is try to repeat the words he hears. Today, while I was busy writing, God knows what possessed him. He jumped to his feet, 
rushed to the control panel and yanked the handle that is supposed to put the rocket into reverse motion. Under its impact, all of us lost our balance and were soon rolling on the floor. Then, somehow I managed to get up, and press the button on Bidhashikar's left shoulder. That incapacitated him instantly. He folded all his arms and legs and fell down, inert. I pulled the other handle on the panel that made us turn back and resume our journey to Mars. What could be the reason behind Bidhashikar's sudden fit of madness? I have decided to keep him switched off until we get to Mars. Then I'll switch him on again. Perhaps I had worked him too hard in trying to teach him to speak. Maybe that put too much pressure on his mind, so he lost it. There are five hours to landing. The blue patches on the planet that I had initially thought were water appear to be something different. Besides, there are slim, red, thread-like structures. I cannot imagine what they are. We landed on Mars two hours ago. I am writing my diary, sitting on a soft yellow rocky mound. Everything here, the trees, the ground, stones and rocks is kind of soft, and feels like rubber. A little distance away, a red river is flowing by. It took me a while to realize that it was a river, as its water looked like clear jelly, a bit like guava jelly. Perhaps all rivers here are red. It is these rivers that had appeared as red threads from space. What had struck me as water, it turned out, was grass and trees and plants. All of it is blue, instead of green. What is green is the sky. Everything is the opposite of what we see on Earth. I haven't yet seen a living creature. Did I make a mistake in my assumptions? There is no noise at all. Except the slight gurgling of the river. The atmosphere is decidedly eerie. Why is everything so quiet? It doesn't feel cold. If anything, it is quite warm. But there is the occasional gust of wind that is very cold indeed. It lasts for only a few seconds, but seems to freeze the very marrow in my bones. Perhaps there is something in the nature of snowy mountains in the distance. At first, I was afraid to taste the water in the river. Then, when I saw Newton drinking it, I felt bold enough to cup my hand and drink a mouthful of water myself. It tasted like ambrosia. Once, I had found the water from a fountain in the Garo Hills amazingly refreshing. But compared to the taste of the water from this river, that was nothing. One sip was enough to wipe out every sign of both physical and mental fatigue. It is only Bidhashikar who is still causing me concern. God knows what's wrong with him. I switched him on as soon as we landed, but he did not move. What's the matter? Don't you want to go out? I asked him. He shook his head. Why, what's wrong? This time, Bidhashikar raised his arms over his head and uttered just one word. His voice sounded frightened. He said, I have no problem in following his words. So I could guess instantly that what he meant to say was, danger. What danger? What are you afraid of? I went on, Bidhashikar's tone remained grave as he answered, Danger. Terrible danger. He said nothing more, nor did he show any interest in joining us. So, in the end, we had to leave him in the rocket. Only Prahlad, Newton and I set foot on Martian soil. It is more than two hours since we landed. 
The awe I felt at first is slowly leaving me. It had not occurred to me before, that a new place could have a distinctive smell of its own. I became aware of the smell here the minute we climbed out of the rocket. It is not coming from the trees, or the river or the soil. I have smelt each of these, they do not bear this smell. It is clearly something inherent in the atmosphere of Mars. Perhaps our Earth has its own smell too. We may not realize it, but if someone from a different planet ever went to Earth, they might sense it at once. Prahlad is collecting pebbles by the river. I have asked him to tell me if he notices any living creature. The green sky has started to turn red. It probably means that dawn is breaking. The sun should rise soon. We have had the most terrifying experience on Mars. I have no idea how long it will take us to get over the shock completely. In fact, I am surprised that we managed to escape alive. It happened on the very first day. As soon as the sun rose, I left the mound where I was sitting and was toying with the idea of exploring further. This time in bright daylight, when a strong fishy smell hit my nostrils, and I heard a strange sound. It sounded as if a large-sized cricket was chirping loudly. I looked around, trying to figure out where the sound was coming from. But, at that precise moment, a terrible scream froze my blood. Then I saw Prahlad. His eyes were bulging, his right arm was wrapped around Newton, and he was sprinting towards the rocket. The creature that was chasing him was not human, nor an animal or a fish. Yet it had something in common with all three. It was about four feet high. It had legs and feet, but instead of arms there were huge fins, like fish. Its head was very big, in the center of which was a single, large green eye. The mouth was gaping wide, but there were no teeth. Its whole body was covered by fish scales, glistening in the sun. The creature could not run very fast. It kept stumbling, almost at every step. So perhaps it would not be able to catch up with Prahlad. I picked up my most deadly weapon and ran after the creature, although I had no wish to use it, unless Prahlad got into real danger. It was not my aim to destroy life on this planet, without a good reason. I was still about 20 yards away from the creature, when Prahlad climbed into the rocket quite safely. What followed was totally unexpected. Bidhashikar jumped out of the rocket and stood in the creature's way. Perfectly taken aback by this development, I halted in my tracks. A sudden gust of wind rose at that moment, bringing with it the same strong stench. I wheeled around and saw that, from a distance, a large number of similar creatures at least 300 of them were making their way towards us, swaying gently on their feet. They were all making that horrible chirping noise. Bidhashikar swung his arm, and brought it down on the creature he was facing. It gave a little squeak, flapped its fins and fell to the ground. Afraid that he might get carried away and try to tackle the entire Martian army on his own. I ran to Bidhashikar and flung my arms round his waist. But that did nothing to deter him. He began moving towards the other creatures, dragging me with him. I managed to raise my hand and press the switch on his left shoulder. Bidhashikar fell headlong and stopped moving. The Martian army was now within a hundred yards. Their smell was making me sick, the strange eerie noise they were making was almost deafening. How was I supposed to lift? and remove this robot that weighed 90 kilograms. I called out to Prahlad, but got no reply. 
An odd instinct told me to dismantle Bidhashikar, and separate him into two halves. I began loosening the screws fixed on his waist. I could sense that those creatures were getting closer. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw that there were now about a thousand of them. Their bodies shone so brightly in the sun that it was positively blinding. Somehow, I managed to separate Bidhashikar's torso from his legs, and drag the top half back to the rocket, to leave it at its door. Then I began pulling at his legs. I saw the army was within 50 yards. My limbs had started to feel numb. I forgot all about my weapons. When I arrived back at the open door of the rocket, still pulling and dragging Bidhashikar's legs, I discovered that Prahlad had regained consciousness and had already lifted the top half of Bidhashikar's body into the main cabin. I hauled the rest up but, just as I was about to shut the door, I felt something cold and damp strike against my feet. Everything went black immediately. Thereafter I remembered nothing. When I opened my eyes, the rocket was flying once more. My right foot was aching slightly, and a faint, fishy smell still lingered in the cabin. How did the rocket take off? Who started it? Prahlad knew absolutely nothing about the technicalities. And Bidhashikar was still lying in two broken pieces. Did it take off on its own? If that was the case, where was it going? Where were we headed for? Which of the endless planets in the universe would see the end of our journey? Will our journey ever end? Or are we destined to keep flying indefinitely, moving in an unspecified direction? What about food? That will finish one day, surely. What is left will not last beyond four years. What are we going to eat then? I have fiddled with the control panel and other machinery. Nothing appears to be working. Under such circumstances, the rocket should not be flying at all. But it is most definitely in motion. How, I have no idea. A thousand questions are crowding my mind. I cannot find a single answer. From today, I have become totally ignorant, completely helpless. The future is unknown, a deep, dark abyss. We are still flying through space. There is nothing to see outside, so I've closed the shutters. Prahlad has recovered to a great extent, and stopped giving frequent shutters. Newton had gone off his food, but seems to have regained his appetite. Perhaps it was a result of biting a Martian. I still cannot believe what happened. Prahlad's speech is somewhat incoherent even now, but from what he has told me, it appears that while he was collecting pebbles, he was assailed by a fishy smell. He raised his head and saw a funny creature that seemed a mixture of a fish, a human and some weird animal. It was standing nearby, on the river bank. And Newton was slowly making his way to it, his eyes wide. His tail erect. Before Prahlad could move, Newton leapt and pounced upon the creature, sinking his teeth into one of its knees. The creature gave a horrible screech and ran away. But, in the next instant, a similar creature appeared out of nowhere and started chasing Prahlad. What followed I saw with my own eyes. Bidhashikar, I must say, displayed remarkable courage. So I let him rest and take it easy until this morning, when Prahlad and I rejoined the broken pieces of his body. I pressed the switch on his left shoulder and he spoke at once. Thank you. He said clearly. Since that moment, he has been speaking almost as clearly as any human being. But, for some reason, at times he can't seem to find the right words, and ends up sounding quite cryptic. I cannot keep track of time anymore. 
What is the date today? Which year is this? I have no idea. Our food supplies are sadly depleted, they will not last for more than a few days. I feel exhausted both mentally and physically, so do Prahlad and Newton. They are both lying listlessly in a corner. Only Bidhashikar seems his usual self, totally unperturbed by any worry or anxiety. He is seen muttering to himself from time to time. I realized one day that he was simply repeating some lines from the Mahabharata that he had heard Prahlad read aloud, a very long time ago. Earlier today, I was sitting in my seat, still feeling dazed, when Bidhashikar suddenly stopped muttering and said more clearly, Wonderful. Wonderful. What's the matter, Bidhashikar? What's so wonderful? I asked. What's the open the window, said Bidhashikar. Although his speech is now quite clear, for some strange reason, he has taken to speaking old, theatrical language. We might be back in Shakespeare's time. But now he wanted me to open the window. In the past I have paid rather heavily by not listening to him. So, this time, I stretched an arm and removed the shutter from a window. The sight that met my eyes was so perfectly dazzling that, for a time I thought I was going blind. When my vision became normal again, I could see that we were flying through an amazing, incredible area. For as far as my eyes could see, there was an endless stretch of bright bubbles in the sky forming and bursting, forming and bursting. There they were one moment, and in the next, they were gone. Countless golden spheres were expanding and enlarging, until they exploded and made a great golden spray of light, like a fountain, before fading away. No wonder I was totally taken aback by this sight. Even Prahlad could not help feeling enchanted. And Newton? He kept jumping up and scratching the glass on the window. If he could, he would have burst through the pane and leapt out. I have not closed the window shutters since that day. It is impossible to say when the scene outside might change. I can think of nothing else, even hunger and thirst have been forgotten. At this moment, streaks of light are wriggling about in the sky, like snakes. At times, one of them might come very close to our rocket, lighting up the entire cabin. It is as if some king in this new spatial world is having a display of fireworks at some extraordinary royal festival. What happened today made us all break into a cold sweat with the exception of Bidhashikar, of course. The sky was now full of huge, circular rocks. Each had craters, and we could see fiery tongues flick out of them. Our rocket was speeding through these rocks, slipping through narrow spaces to avoid a collision. Prahlad was chanting a prayer constantly. Newton was hiding under a table, trembling violently. Every now and then, it would seem as if we were about to collide with one of those rocks, but each time, as if by magic, our rocket turned away in the nick of time and found an escape route. We were half dead with fear and anxiety, but Bidhashikar stayed perfectly calm. He remained seated in his chair, rocking himself, and exclaiming, Tafa! Tafa! from time to time. This is a new word he has been uttering lately. I didn't have a clue what he meant by it, but earlier today, its meaning became clear. I was offering a fish pill to Newton, when Bidhashikar suddenly shouted, Tafa! Tafa, and rushed to the window. I followed him and looked out. The sky was now empty. There were no lights and no rocks nothing except a bright white planet, clear and pure like a full moon, looking down at us, there was no doubt that our rocket was heading for it. If Bidhashikar had to be believed, that planet was called Tafa. The scenery outside the window is truly beautiful. Tafa is clearly visible, and now we can see millions of blinking lights on its surface, as if they are myriad fireflies glowing in the dark. Their light is strong enough to illuminate our cabin. 
It reminds me of the firefly I saw in my dream, back in my garden in Jiridi. Each of us is happy today. Perhaps our expedition will be successful, after all. Tafa is getting closer every minute. Judging by its present distance, we will probably reach it tomorrow. There is no way of seeing any detail on its surface, except those fireflies. Bidhushikar has been talking a lot of rubbish again. What he has been saying is quite incredible. He has been extraordinarily cheerful these past few days, so I am beginning to think that perhaps his brain is affected once more. According to him, the inhabitants of Tafa are the first civilized race in the entire universe. Their civilization is older by several million years than that on our Earth. Every single inhabitant is a brilliant scientist. Since each of them is as clever as the other, they are finding it quite difficult to live with one another. It is for this reason that, over the last few years, they have been importing less intelligent people from other planets and getting them to live in Tafa. Is that so? I asked. In that case, they should find it quite useful to have Prahlad around, wouldn't you say? At this remark, Bidhushikar broke into a guffaw and began clapping. He made such an awful racket that I was obliged to press the switch on his shoulder. We reached Tafa yesterday. When I climbed out of the rocket, I saw that a large number of people had gathered to welcome me. I am referring to them as people, but they don't look like normal people at all. If one can imagine what a giant ant might look like, one will get an idea of their appearance. Their heads are large, and so are their eyes, but their arms and legs are very thin, as if they have no use for their limbs. There is no doubt that, what Bidhushikar had told me about them is wholly untrue. In fact, I think the truth is just the opposite. That is to say, these creatures are far behind our human civilization. It will take them thousands of years to catch up with the human race. The way they live is totally primitive, compared to our own lifestyle. There are no buildings or houses in Tafa, nor are there trees and plants. The inhabitants appear to live underground, they just disappear into holes. But they have given me a proper house to live in. It is exactly like my house in Jiridi, except that it does not have a laboratory. Prahlad and Newton are fine. They have settled down very well, and do not seem to be even aware that they are on a different planet, living in a totally different atmosphere. Only Bidhushikar has disappeared. He vanished almost as soon as we got here. Perhaps, having told me a pack of lies about these people, he is too embarrassed to face me. I have decided to stop writing my diary after today, as I do not see any chance of anything happening here that might be worth recording. My only regret is that, there is no way of sending my diary back to Earth. It is packed with such a lot of valuable information. The fools who live here will never understand its meaning, nor will they let me go back. To tell the truth, I am in no hurry to go back to Earth, for I am being very well looked after here. Perhaps these creatures think they can get a lot out of me. How they learn to speak in any language, I do not know. But the advantage in being able to communicate is that if I scold any of them, the creature can understand my words. Only the other day, I called an ant and said, Well, where are your scientists and all those clever people I have heard about? Let me speak to them. You lot are running so far behind us humans. The ant replied, What will you do with scientists, or science? Why don't you just stay the way you are? We'll visit you from time to time, all right? We find your plain and simple words, your naivety, most entertaining. What impertinence. Highly incensed, I took my snuff gun and fired it directly at the ant's nostrils. But nothing happened. The ant remained quite unaffected. The reason was clear. 
These creatures haven't even learned to sneeze. Readers might wonder where I have kept Professor Shanka's diary, and whether one might see this remarkable object. What I wanted to do was to have the paper and ink examined by a scientist, and then I would have handed it over to a museum. Anyone could have gone and looked at it there. But there is no way of doing that now. The day I finished making a copy of the entire diary and dropped it off at the press for printing, an amazing thing happened. I returned home and went to my bedroom to get the original diary from the bookshelf. The space it had been occupying was empty. All that remained of the diary was a small piece of its red cover, and a few pages, chewed to a powder. Nearly a hundred hungry black ants were still crawling all over these remnants. They had eaten the entire diary. What little remained vanished before my eyes. All I could do was stare in disbelief. The object that had appeared completely indestructible finally turned into fodder for black ants. For the life of me, I cannot see how that could happen. Can you think of a reason? You are listening, A Diary of a Space Traveler, written by Satyajit Roy. Story on Friday thanks all the listeners. See you again with another story next week. Till then stay healthy, stay well.